Hi there, I'm Christy. And I'm Heather. We're two best friends, longtime comedians, and hosts of the podcast Sinisterhood, the true crime comedy podcast that covers all things creepy. With thorough research and legal insights from me, a real-life lawyer, we'll bring you the in-depth details on all the cases you crave on topics like serial killers, disappearances, cults, cryptids, and even Britney Spears conservatorship. Listen to Sinisterhood on the iHeart app or wherever you get your podcasts. I have three kids, and all of them learn and take in information differently. Not all kids thrive in a traditional classroom setting, and oftentimes, the standard subjects just don't appeal to kids. So when I learned about OutSchool, I got excited because it's as if they were reading my mind. My daughter's been curious about video content for quite some time now. She sees me creating TikToks to promote my podcast, and she wants to do the same thing, but her interest is more toward YouTube videos. With OutSchool, she can learn how to create YouTube content in an interactive class, and we can even choose her class size, teaching instructor, and teaching method. OutSchool offers online immersive classes that are live and cater to kids ages 3 to 18. OutSchool has classes that teach karate, video game design, and how to become a YouTuber and more. Basically, they offer really cool classes that kids are actually into and that can teach them skills they won't get from traditional education. And they might even make a new friend or two. OutSchool helps kids explore their interests and discover new ones. Right now, for a limited time, you'll save $15 on your child's first class when you go to outschool.com slash murderish and use code murderish. That's O-U-T-S-C-H-O-O-L dot com slash murderish. Code murderish to save $15 off your child's first class. Outschool.com slash murderish. Code murderish. The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions about the death of a minor and animals. Listener discretion is advised. When a family's financial situation drastically improves, temptation can lurk around every corner. Some people come into wealth with a level head, treating themselves to modest luxuries now that they can afford them. Others get tunnel vision, lavishing in extravagance like there's no tomorrow. And the truth is that sometimes outward appearances completely obscure a less glamorous reality. Chris Foster of Lancashire, England, had known a working-class lifestyle for most of his adulthood. In 1997, though, fortune suddenly smiled upon him. At 39 years old, following a monumental tragedy, Foster invented and patented a product that would revolutionize the global oil and gas industries. In a darkly ironic twist, oil would play a major role in the unthinkable crimes he committed in 2008. His crime shocked all of Britain, making headlines as far as Australia for years to come. This is Jamie, and you're listening to Murderish, Join me as I walk you through the case involving Jill and Kirstie Foster. The majority of this case is set in Maysbrook, an exclusive rural village in Shropshire, England, near the border of Wales. Nestled in the English countryside are vine-covered mansions amid winding farmland. According to The Guardian, many of Maysbrook's residents are self-made millionaires emerging from industrial cities like Birmingham and Wolverhampton. Chris Foster had a long journey to wealth. He came from much more humble beginnings. Christopher Foster was born on July 9, 1958, to parents Enid and Geoffrey. They lived in Burnley, a town in Lancashire around 20 miles north of Manchester. Geoffrey worked as a sales director for a manufacturing chemist to support his family. Chris's brother, Andrew, entered the world in September of 1962. Despite the proximity in age, the two Foster brothers were far from close. Some of the distance came down to having vastly different personalities. While Andrew was introspective, reserved, and soft-spoken, Chris was domineering, outgoing, and had a volatile temper. They often argued as children, which sometimes manifested into physical violence. Chris's aggressive disposition continued when the family relocated to Wolverhampton, a manufacturing city in central England. Looking back years later, 
Andrew told the Express and Star about his brother. He was a bully. He got beaten up at school, got his nose broken, and ended up in juvenile court. But it wasn't just fist fights. Andrew alleged that Chris began sexually abusing him. Chris was about 15 years old and Andrew was only 11 when the alleged abuse started. He told the Shropshire Star the abuse was about control. He always denied it, but there was a pattern in Chris's life and it revolved around controlling other people. The clashing of temperaments and alleged abuse caused the brothers to be mostly estranged as adults. They both became salesmen, but that was probably all they had in common. Andrew eventually worked his way up to a management position, while Chris worked in insulation sales. Chris's life in Wolverhampton was unremarkable until he met Jill, the woman who would become his wife. They met in 1983 through Jill's older sister, Anne Giddings, who had dated one of Chris's friends. Anne said to the Mirror about Chris, he had a huge ego, I couldn't stand the sight of him, and I was stunned when my sister fell for him. He was flash and false, and the only person he cared about was himself. Three years later, in 1987, Chris and Jill tied the knot. When Anne wasn't chosen as a bridesmaid, she decided to boycott the wedding. She told the mirror, that was the beginning of the end with my sister. I know it was Chris's doing because he controlled everything. He did it to show he was the boss. After that, Jill and Anne led relatively separate lives. Anne's disdain for her brother-in-law put a strain on her relationship with Jill. Before long, the sisters only saw each other at major family events like funerals and weddings. Chris and his brother Andrew's relationship nearly mirrored that of Jill and her sister. It was no coincidence that Chris was the common denominator in both equations. It's unknown what ultimately caused the brothers to fall out, but Andrew eventually accepted the fact that Chris was not going to change. Andrew told the Express and Star, I realized that I had to get away from him and create my own life. I wrote to him several times to see if we could sit down as adults and discuss things, but he was uncompromising. Once you had fallen out with him, that was it. Soon after their wedding, Jill and Chris bought their first home in Wolverhampton. It was a modest brick-built starter home. Less than a year later, Chris found himself unemployed when the company he worked for went bankrupt. To keep his marriage intact, Chris had to quickly find other means of earning a living wage. Media outlets would later theorize that losing his job served as a catalyst for Chris's eureka moment. Inspired by news of a tragic event that occurred that year, Chris's lucrative invention would alter the course of his life forever. Given my brush with a really scary situation years ago, I am big on home security. My house has been protected by Simply Safe for quite some time, and I absolutely sleep better at night knowing that my family and I have home security in place. We have Simply Safe video cameras set up to watch over the perimeter of our house, as well as window sensors and motion sensors, because it's so important to feel safe in your own home. We've all binged enough true crime content to know that anyone, anywhere can be a crime victim. Why not decrease your odds of becoming a victim by installing Simply Safe in your home? Which, by the way, is the easiest system to install. My husband and I installed the entire Simply Safe system in about an hour. The instructions were extremely easy to follow, and we never felt overwhelmed by the installation process. Something else I love about our Simply Safe system is that it looks clean and modern, and it fits right in with our newly remodeled home. It's not bulky and a huge eyesore like some other security systems I've seen. You can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com murderish. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafe.com slash murderish. Any chance I can get to sneak off and take about five minutes for myself, I take it. Recently, my husband was putting together the latest science kit that came in the mail for our daughter. So I retreated to our bedroom and got about 10 minutes of pure bliss as I played Best Fiends. It's a really fun and visually intriguing mobile puzzle game that's hard to put down once you start playing. I think the reason Best Fiends draws you in is because the game has these really cute characters that you can grow a little attached to. 
They're called fiends, and you're able to customize your team of fiends to defeat the slugs. Another reason I think people get hooked on playing best fiends is because it's always fresh. There are brand new events and challenges being added all the time, so you never get bored with the same old thing. The game is really fun, but it also takes skill to advance through levels, which feels like exercise for your brain. If you're looking for a fun and challenging alternative to doom scrolling through social media, try Best Fiends. Download your new favorite getaway, Best Fiends, for free today on the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. I recently launched a new podcast about a scam artist, and it got me thinking, many of us have been on the other side of a scam that you may not have even thought was a scam. You know those free trials that automatically renew, and you've been paying monthly fees for a service that you don't even need? That's a scam. But with Truebill, you can kick those unwanted subscriptions to the curb and start saving a lot of money. Truebill is a new app that identifies unwanted subscriptions and then cancels them with just one tap. I think one of the reasons many of us end up with numerous unwanted subscriptions is that we just forget about them. And that's exactly what greedy corporations want you to do. That's where Truebill comes in. And people who use the app save up to $720 per year on average. That's $60 per month that you could be using toward things and experiences you actually want or need. I'm gonna save about $400 this year with the subscriptions that Truebill helped me cancel. And I was really surprised because I had no idea that I'd been paying $12.99 per month for just one of the costly subscriptions. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com murderish. Go right now, Truebill.com murderish. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com murderish. On July 6, 1988, an oil platform known as Piper Alpha detonated in the North Sea. The explosion happened roughly 120 miles off the coast of Aberdeen, Scotland. Due to a lapse in safety protocols, a series of explosions and the resulting debris claimed the lives of 165 of the 226 men working aboard the rig. While the lives lost were tragic enough, Piper Alpha also accounted for nearly 10% of oil and gas production in the region. Its destruction resulted in the loss of 1.7 billion pounds, or around $3.4 billion. To this day, it remains one of the worst offshore oil disasters in global history. Along with the rest of the world, Chris followed news reports on the Piper Alpha incident. An investigation concluded that simultaneous maintenance performed on a pump and pressure safety valve caused oil condensation to leak and ignite. Due to his experience in selling insulating materials, Chris had the idea to invent a fire-resistant form of insulation for oil pipe valves. Entrepreneurship can come at a high cost, and that was certainly the case with Chris, but Jill supported her husband in his endeavor. While Chris relentlessly pursued his dreams, Jill gave birth to a daughter named Kirsty Louise on August 18, 1993, and fatherhood seemed to motivate Chris to succeed even more. According to the book Deadly Intent, Chris remortgaged his home to afford experimentation with different chemical formulas. It was a gamble that undoubtedly paid off. Chris eventually emerged with a special blend of rubber and plastic that formed a secure, crisp shell around safety valves used on oil rigs. By 1997, Chris patented his product, which he called OlvaShield. The following year, he founded the business Olva Limited, which was based out of Staffordshire in the rural West Midlands. He hired his wife Jill as his secretary. Chris's business received a huge boost when his invention received an extremely rare A1 rating in British standards for fire protection. This classification is only assigned to materials that are completely non-combustible. Big oil companies took note of the innovation, and orders began rolling in. The first major deal was with Petro-Canada, securing Chris's company a hefty 500,000 pounds. He soon landed several offshore contracts and the money continued to flow in. The Foster's lifestyle soon reflected their newfound wealth. 
Chris purchased luxury cars and moved his family into a bigger house in the exclusive Shropshire village of Allscott. His daughter Kirsty had a fondness for horses from an early age, so he bought her some of her own. The real turning point in Chris's career came in 2003, when, in order to keep up with demand, he recognized the need for a larger supplier than the ones he'd been using. So, he contracted with Soham-based DRC Distribution Limited to manufacture his product on a grand scale. Mass production enabled Chris's company to supply Ulvashield to big league international oil companies, including Exxon, BP, Shell, and 39 others. These contracts earned Chris millions. It was a remarkable accomplishment for someone who came from a working class family. In October of 2004, Chris and his family moved once again, this time into a mansion known as Osbaston House in the posh Shropshire village of Maysbrook. The 1.5 million pound country estate sat on 16 acres of land and featured a wooded area, a lake, and several outbuildings. Inside the three-story vine-covered Georgian-era mansion, there were five bedrooms, three bathrooms, an orangery, a cellar, three main reception rooms, and a spacious modern kitchen. Jill and Kirsty adored animals. Ducks and chickens roamed freely on the land, while Kirsty's three horses occupied the stables. They also had a handful of guinea pigs and four dogs. Chris opted to spend his money on more material items. He had amassed a fleet of luxury cars that included two Porsches, an Aston Martin, and a Ferrari. He also bought a truck for Jill and a tractor for the property. As journalist John Ronson would later say about Chris's spending habits in The Guardian, he was doing an extreme version of what an awful lot of people were doing back then, living on credit, believing the boom would never bust. Chris took up several new hobbies based on his new surroundings, which included fishing and hunting. He developed a fascination with guns, which went hand in hand with his love of clay pigeon shooting. The sport, which evolved after live pigeon shooting was banned in the UK in 1921, involves shooting at a clay projectile while airborne. Its popularity has spread to the US and the sport is even featured in the Summer Olympics. To collect guns, Chris had to obtain a firearms license, which is a much more extensive process in the UK compared to the US. According to The Guardian, police assess whether someone is fit to own guns through interviews, background checks, visits to the applicant's property, and references from friends. After obtaining his gun license, Chris joined several exclusive clay pigeon shooting clubs. He was also known to engage in target practice on the grounds of his lavish estate. His daughter, Kirsty, found her own place in the community. She entered various horse riding competitions, and she was good at it. It was obvious to everyone who knew the teenager that horses were her life. Many of Kirsty's peers were fond of her. She was kind, cheerful, and bubbly like her mother. Kirsty attended Ellesmere, a private school that cost a hefty 16,000 pounds per year. She was an above average student who played netball and hockey. Despite her family's wealth, Kirsty was incredibly down to earth and popular. Any free time apart from her studies was spent chatting with friends on the social media platform Bebo. Brendan Wignall, the head teacher at Kirsty's school, described her to The Independent as a happy, hardworking, and charming student. Neighbors and other Maysbrook residents all saw the Fosters as a wonderful, loving family. They were often invited to neighborhood gatherings, and some acquaintances attended Kirstie's competitions to show their support. Under the surface, however, trouble was brewing. In 2005, Chris learned that his spending had landed his company in considerable debt. To compensate, he cut corners by contracting a supplier in California that could manufacture Ulvashield at lower costs. But the cost-cutting action violated Chris's company's supply agreement with DRC, who'd been contracted to supply 100% of the product. The UK manufacturer found themselves with a warehouse full of products that they weren't permitted to sell because of Chris's patent. DRC sued Ulva for breach of contract and won. Olva paid an undisclosed settlement based on credit since the lawsuit put the company at a deficit. 
Chris found himself in court again a year later. In December of 2005, he accused two former business associates of blackmailing him over a joint property deal in Cyprus. A November 2006 trial at Shrewsbury Crown Court found both men not guilty. By 2007, Chris's once thriving company was in dire straits. According to the Sunday Mercury, the business was facing debts of 450,000 pounds and owed 835,000 pounds in taxes. The struggling company was placed in the hands of administrators, but in October, Ulva Limited went into liquidation. Its assets were later transferred to DRC's parent company. Before the liquidation, however, it was discovered that Chris had transferred assets, employees, equipment, and customers to a new company he called Ulva International. DRC sued a second time, and a hearing was held on February 28, 2008, at the Royal Courts of Justice. Once again, the court ruled against Chris Foster. According to the National News, Lord Justice Reimer said Foster was bereft of the basic instincts of commercial morality, and he added he was not to be trusted. This was the beginning of the end, not just for Chris and his company, but for everything he owned and everyone he held dear. But many people would later say they had no way of knowing what would come next. August 25, 2008 was a bank holiday. Most schools were also closed that Monday. On that late summer bank holiday, the Fosters attended a neighbor's barbecue. While Kirsty chatted with neighborhood friends, Chris participated in a clay pigeon shooting with the barbecue host. It was a lovely afternoon that did not foreshadow the horror to come. The Fosters headed back to their home around 8.30 that evening. While Jill and Chris puttered around the house, 15-year-old Kirsty chatted on Bebo with friends. At around 1 a.m., both mother and daughter went to bed. Chris stayed awake because he hadn't been sleeping much lately. In the hours that followed, the worst fate anyone could fathom came to pass. At around 4 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, August 26th, several neighbors woke to the sound of a deafening explosion. All four of Chris's cars in the garage were engulfed in flames. Several 999 calls were made to emergency services as witnesses realized a massive fire was sweeping across the Foster's entire property. Mysteriously, a horse box was parked in front of the mansion gates with its tires shot out. Authorities had to have it towed in order to gain access to the property. A dozen firefighters worked to extinguish the blaze, leaving behind a blackened shell of the formerly opulent mansion. Initially, all three members of the Foster family were reported missing. An investigation had to be delayed when the structure was deemed too perilous for anyone to enter. The extreme heat and falling debris could have caused serious harm to emergency workers. As reports of the catastrophic fire made local news, the media speculated about the Foster's whereabouts. Maybe the family was on vacation, maybe there had been a home invasion or a kidnapping. The wildest theory, published in gossip newspaper The Daily Mail, had one of Chris's former associates speculating that he was on the lam in Europe. None of these theories were proven true. The following day, West Mercia police began their search in and around the horse stables. Sadly, all three of Kirstie's beloved horses were found dead, evidently killed by gunshot. It was later discovered that the family dogs were also killed in the same way. Finally, after three days of delays, investigators were able to enter what remained of the house. Their initial search was brief as the property wasn't structurally sound. Kirstie's friends had told police that they were chatting with her just a few hours before the fire, so they retrieved her charred computer as part of their investigation. Perhaps in Kirstie's conversations, they would find some clues that would piece together some of the puzzle. Upon further investigation, Kirstie's chat history revealed nothing out of the ordinary for a 15-year-old talking with friends. It was apparent that the teenager had no idea that she was in any danger. What the computer history did confirm was that Kirstie had definitely been home that evening. Investigators took the horse box that was blocking the gates 
in for forensic examination, along with spent and unspent gun cartridges scattered around the estate grounds. And then, while carefully surveying the crime scene, investigators uncovered two bodies in the rubble, but it wasn't apparent who they were. West Mercia Police Superintendent Gary Higgins told news outlets that identification would require the use of DNA testing and dental records. On August 31st, one of the bodies was confirmed to be 49-year-old Jill Foster. It was determined that her death was caused by a single gunshot wound to the back of her head. Suddenly, the devastating case went from a fire investigation to a murder investigation. Although a body confirmed to be Chris Foster was also found, his cause of death remained undetermined until a post-mortem examination was performed. The search for Kirstie persisted. Her body was eventually discovered on September 1st in an area underneath what used to be her bedroom. Enough of her remains were retrieved to identify the body and establish that she had died in the same manner as her mother, a gunshot wound. The findings were devastating. Now that the bodies of the Fosters had been located, police had a lot of unanswered questions. Some unsettling truths would emerge in the futile effort to understand why this happened. The public's reaction to the devastating crime was captured by the national news, who wrote that the tragedy both engrossed and appalled all of Britain. More speculation surrounding the incident percolated, with gossip columnists and former business associates wondering if the Fosters had been assassinated by gangsters. Family members were eager to know what happened leading up to the fire, but they were also understandably consumed by grief. Andrew Foster, Chris's estranged brother, and their mother Enid first heard about the event through the news reports. It was only later that police reached out to them. Andrew told the Daily Star, we are all in a terrible state of shock. Roger Doley, Jill's brother, who worked as a sales executive in Wolverhampton, first heard about the fire from his neighbors. Police contacted him later that day to tell him that the family was missing. The information filled Roger with dread, which was only confirmed when his sister's body was identified. He told the Mirror, I'm heartbroken. Jill was just a nice girl. She always had a nice smile and always made you feel welcome. Nobody could believe that 15-year-old Kirstie was gone too. Her best friend, Megan Bray, appeared outside the mansion with her mother, Fiona, after they heard the tragic news. For days after Kirstie's body was identified, they waited patiently before police allowed them through the cordon to lay down flower bouquets. According to the Daily Star, a note attached to the bouquet read, To Kirstie, Jill, and Chris, I can't believe you are all gone. You were all such a great family, and I am going to miss you all. It was not your time to go, and I will never forget any of you. School will never be the same without you. Quoted in the same Daily Star article, Megan's mother Fiona added, My daughter has lost such a close friend. It is all so much to take in. Other friends took to Bebo, where they wrote messages conveying how much they would miss Kirsty. According to the Lancashire Star, another classmate made a photo montage on YouTube to pay tribute to her. Brendan Wignall, head teacher at Kirstie's school, shared his thoughts with The Independent by saying, Kirstie certainly had a very bright future. She had all the skills needed to go far in life. I have no doubt she would have made a success of herself. The Fosters always appeared to be a close, loving, and united family. Kirstie will be remembered with love and affection by those who knew her well. She will be greatly missed. While the Fosters' deaths were publicly mourned, findings from the ongoing investigation would bring forth a whole new set of reactions. Most of us took sex ed back in the day and it was all about how to prevent pregnancy, but they never told us how to plan for pregnancy when we're ready to start a family. Modern fertility is an affordable and simple way to test your fertility hormones from home, and it just takes a simple poke to the finger to do it. Rather than just diving into trying for a baby without any insight on your hormone levels, how many eggs you have compared to other women your age, and other key fertility factors, 
you can actually plan ahead with modern fertility. You'll be fascinated by the results because you'll get a clear explanation regarding what every hormone means. You'll probably have some questions once you've read your results and modern fertility has got you covered because you can speak with a fertility nurse and get answers to any questions you have. Of course, you can go the traditional route and test your hormones and egg count with your doctor, but that could cost you over a thousand dollars. Modern Fertility provides the same information at a price of $159. Right now, Modern Fertility is offering our listeners $20 off the test when you go to modernfertility.com slash murderish. That means your test will cost $139 instead of the hundreds or thousands it could cost at your doctor's office. Get $20 off your fertility test when you go to modernfertility.com slash murderish modernfertility.com slash murderish. You guys, I found a streaming service that offers so much bang for my buck. Acorn TV is the largest commercial free British streaming service and the library of shows is awesome. I found really compelling mysteries that not only have a great storyline and a cast of actors, but they're witty and uniquely entertaining too. Acorn TV has a library of exclusive premieres and originals out of Britain, Ireland, Australia, and beyond. And yes, the accents are so endearing. If you're bored of all the shows on your current streaming service, check out Agatha Raisin on Acorn TV. The show is on season four and it just keeps getting better. It's an Acorn TV original set in Britain. Ashley Jensen is a fashionable sleuth who will draw you in from episode one. The New York Times referred to Agatha Raisin saying, comic mystery with delightful Ashley Jensen. Acorn TV delivers thousands of hours of new and exciting content for a fraction of the cost compared to other streaming services. For just $5.99 per month, you'll get access to enthralling mysteries, dramas, comedies, and so much more. For original shows from Britain and beyond, Acorn TV has them all. You're going to love it like I do. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and using my promo code MURDERISH, but you have to enter the code in all lowercase letters. That's A-C-O-R-N dot TV, promo code MURDERISH, to get your first 30 days for free. Acorn.tv, code MURDERISH. eBay sellers, Etsy shop owners, and all online sellers, listen up. Shopify should be your go-to solution for connecting with customers, driving sales, and managing your day-to-day. Here's why. Shopify is more than just a store. The platform lets you accept all major payment methods, has thousands of integrations and third-party apps from accounting to on-demand printing to chatbots and so much more. Basically, Shopify offers all of the key tools that every business owner needs to help them succeed. And since staying on top of key insights like your business's profitability, conversion rates, and more is also important for all business owners, Shopify offers these reports as well. Maintaining a successful business is not easy, but if you employ the right solutions, you're better equipped to not only maintain your business, but grow your business. Let Shopify work for you and your business, reach customers online and across social media with a suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok, and more. Go to shopify.com slash murderish, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash murderish right now. Shopify.com slash murderish. In the days after the fatal blaze, officers from the West Mercia Police Force interviewed several people tied to the family. They started with Andrew Foster. Two family liaison officers came to Andrew's house to question him about his brother. It was immediately clear that they were assessing him as a potential suspect. Andrew told the officers he hadn't seen his older brother in over four years. When pressed on the reason for the estrangement, he spoke of the sexual abuse he allegedly endured growing up. He also revealed that his brother had a temper and he knew of instances when Chris physically abused his wife, Jill. Then another revelation came to light. Chris had been involved in several extramarital affairs over the years. 
Ann Giddings, Jill's sister, confirmed this, both in private police interviews and publicly to the press. She told The Guardian that her brother-in-law had at least eight mistresses since his marriage to Jill and said, he had a thing about blondes. Jill knew all about his affairs. There were lots of women on the scene, but she played the dutiful wife and kept quiet. He wasn't a good looking guy, but money did the talking. He was always flashing the cash. It seemed to give him confidence. The investigation took on a new angle when police learned about the contrast between Chris's public facing persona and his private life. Even though he presented himself as a charismatic family man, Chris kept his financial struggles well hidden from many people who were close to him. Detectives quickly delved into Chris's prior court hearings and found out at the same time of the house fire, he was more than four million pounds in debt. In fact, on that fateful day, bailiffs intended to seize all of his possessions. An anonymous police source spoke to the national news saying that they had interviewed neighbors who attended the barbecue. The anonymous source said, by all accounts, all of them seemed relaxed and happy at the barbecue. They talked about Kirsty returning to her private school, and though Mr. Foster moaned a bit about the economic situation, there was absolutely nothing to indicate that he was under any great stress. To ease public fears that the inferno was potentially the work of a madman still on the loose, Detective Superintendent John Groves held a press conference on September 3, 2008, and ruled out the kidnapping and gangster conspiracies. As quoted by Marie Claire UK, he said, This is a very complex and unusual case, and around 100 officers and staff have been working hard to establish the circumstances leading up to the fire. The crime scene that greeted fire crews and police was particularly difficult we've carried out painstaking work. Based on CCTV footage obtained of the Foster's property grounds, as well as some circumstantial evidence, authorities became certain that Chris Foster had ignited the fire himself. Surveillance in the UK has become part of everyday life. The British Security Industry Association, or BSIA, estimates there are around 5.2 million closed circuit or CCTV cameras around the country as of 2020. According to the website politics.co.uk, surveillance cameras are instrumental to the detection of suspicious or criminal behavior and the investigation of criminal incidents. While the widespread use of street cameras might be controversial, the BSIA found that 96% of CCTV cameras in the UK are owned by private businesses and homeowners. Video footage pulled from three cameras on the Osbaston House property helped police establish a definitive timeline. The cameras were positioned in view of the front of the house, driveway, and the main stable that housed Kirsty's horses. In the early morning hours of August 26, 2008, a man matching 50-year-old Chris Foster's description could be seen strolling out of the stables carrying a 22 caliber rifle. The two outhouses engulfed in flames were seen in the background as he climbed into a truck hauling a horse box. Minutes later, he abandoned the horse box at the gates and then fired the gun at all four tires, presumably to prevent anyone from interfering with his plans. According to The Independent, another camera captured the man heading into the main house and then boarding up windows and doors on the lower level. The footage served as irrefutable evidence that the fire was set intentionally and Chris was solely responsible for the arson. Based on the timestamp of video footage, police determined that Jill had been shot in her sleep. Then Chris had moved on to his daughter's bedroom. It's possible that Kirsty was still chatting on Bebo when the fatal bullet struck the back left of her head. Because Chris's body had been found on top of Jill's, detectives surmised that he had laid down in bed next to his wife before ending his life. It still wasn't clear at that point if Chris had shot himself. When press coverage exposed the implication of a murder-suicide, all of Britain was reeling from shock. People who had never even crossed paths with the Fosters were sickened by Chris's callous acts. On September 7th, 
less than two weeks after the mansion burned to the ground, Chris's mother Enid released a public statement through West Mercia Police. According to The Guardian, her statement read, I can't condone what he's done, but I've lost a dearly loved son, daughter-in-law, and beautiful granddaughter. He talked to nobody. We knew nothing about his financial situation, and it's come as a tremendous shock. So many of his friends have told me that had they known, they would have helped him however they could. They were a very close, loving family unit, and I don't think he could face telling them they were going to lose everything. But I am in no way condoning what he's done. It's very hard. That same day, Ann Giddings, Jill's sister, spoke to the Sunday Mirror, reacting to the new revelations. She called Chris a sick monster and a coward, adding he obviously valued money over his family. Otherwise, they would still be alive. They would have no money, but they would still have their family. He had a choice. If he couldn't manage without his money, why didn't he just kill himself? He never gave them a chance. It was devastating for the general public to process someone being capable of such a reprehensible crime. Jill and Kirstie's loved ones were outraged. Their lives had been taken by someone who had vowed to protect them. Chris's family and friends were rightfully horrified as well, and some of them wondered how could they have not seen the signs that he was capable of such destruction. But hindsight is twenty twenty, and oftentimes, people don't fully realize a person's potential to inflict harm of this magnitude until it's too late. By December of 2008, search efforts on the Osbaston House property concluded. The Foster family could finally be laid to rest. On December 20th, two separate funeral services were held in St. John's Church, one for Jill and Kirsty, and another for Chris three hours later. The earlier service had such high attendance, the church could not accommodate everyone. Over 100 mourners gathered, spilling out into the churchyard to pay their respects to Jill and her daughter. Some would hear the archdeacon's words of lamentation within the echoes of the church's walls. Others, who may have arrived a bit late, listened over a loudspeaker in the narrow churchyard. But all of them would get the opportunity to express their inconsolable farewells. Archdeacon Tony Sadler, who greeted those who attended, quoted in The Independent by saying, No one could have predicted that such a tragedy as this could happen in the depth of this beautiful Shropshire countryside. All those who know the family are still numb as they struggle to put out of their minds the sad events that bring us all here today. He said the Fosters were well-liked in Maysbrook, even though they had moved there less than five years before their deaths. When he memorialized Kirsty, the Archdeacon spoke of her enthusiasm for horses. He shared how she had intended to study at the Equestrian College at Gloucestershire University. And Kirsty was so skillful at equestrianism. According to the Shropshire Star, just three days before the blaze, Kirsty had won the champion show pony trophy at Barryu Show at Welsh's Village Livestock Fair that attracts visitors and competitors far and wide. It would have devastated her to know that her father had recklessly shot her prize horses and her beloved pet dogs. Toward the end of the service, Jill's family shared their plans to set up a charity trust in Kirstie's memory, the Kirstie Foster Trust to assist writing for the disabled. Chris Foster's funeral service was much quieter. Fewer people showed up. Despite their differences, Andrew attended with his wife and three children along with his mother Enid. Archdeacon Sadler delivered another funeral sermon, but the tone of this one felt different. As quoted by The Independent, the Archdeacon said, Our imaginations are in need of healing. I hope this service will help do that. We are sad and we are hurting. Part of the pain is caused by our realizing that young lives have been cut short before their time. More so, I believe the hurt comes as a result of our extreme difficulty in finding forgiveness in our hearts for what has happened. Forgiveness would not come easily, if at all. Chris's immediate family were angered by what he'd done. In a written statement released to the media, Mr. Foster said, 
Today, we have finally been able to lay Jill and Kirstie to rest in a peaceful and dignified manner. We will never come to terms with what has happened and we'll never understand why Chris took Jill and Kirstie's lives away from them. We can only hope and pray that they now rest in peace. Jill and Kirstie shared one grave, but Chris was buried alone, but in a nearby plot, a decision that deeply offended Jill's family. They found it disgraceful to have her killer laid to rest so close by. Anne Giddings said she finds it impossible to visit the grave of her sister and niece. She told the mirror, it's not personal with him there. I can't go and talk to her because it feels like he's listening in. It's like he's haunting us forever. The scars may never heal for the Foster's loved ones. The devastation Chris left behind in the wake of his extreme choices is so difficult to accept. There's nobody to bring to trial, no one to hold directly accountable. Regardless, police had to close the official investigation and an inquest followed. If you aren't native to the UK, an inquest is a legal proceeding held by a coroner. According to the nonprofit organization, the Coroner's Court Support Service, an inquest is an investigation into a death which appears to be due to unknown, violent, or unnatural causes designed to find out who the deceased was and where, when, and how. An inquest lasting two days was held in early April of 2009 at Shrewsbury Magistrates Court. Coroner John Ellery would finalize the cause of death for each of the Fosters by its conclusion. Enid and Andrew Foster attended the proceedings, but Jill's family couldn't bear it. Photos were shown of Osbiston House before and after the fire, along with upsetting graphic footage. Detective Constable Paul Rogers from the Oswa Street Criminal Investigation Department showed the CCTV footage. He also told the inquest about factors that contributed to the intensity of the fire, including the presence of heating oil containers inside the house and a full oil tank in one of the outbuildings providing heat to the home. Authorities estimate that Chris Foster used around 200 gallons of oil to start the fire. Also at the inquest was a pathologist from the Home Office, a government department responsible for reducing and preventing crime. As reported by The Guardian, Dr. Alexander Kohler discussed his findings after conducting post-mortem examinations of Jill, Kirsty, and Chris. He confirmed that Jill Foster had died from a gunshot wound to the head. Kirsty had a bullet entry point on the left side of her head caused by a high velocity impact, which left her disfigured. It was possible that this wound was not fatal, though she might have ultimately been killed by falling debris. According to the Evening Standard, Dr. Kohler could not find any gunshot wounds to Chris's brain or any vital organs, but he wasn't able to rule out if he had shot himself elsewhere on his body. Alcohol was found in Chris's system, which may have played a role in his reckless actions, but the investigation had proven this crime was premeditated. The Guardian cited the pathologist as finalizing Chris's cause of death as a result of inhalation of the products of combustion. He also remarked that evidence indicated he was alive for tens of minutes before the flames overcame him and he expired. In addition, there was personal testimony from those who knew Chris. His financial rut and the emotional toll was revealed by former associate Mark Bassett, who claimed Chris had confided in him about being suicidal at the thought of losing everything. According to The Independent, Bassett said he felt they had become accustomed to a certain standard of living a certain quality of life, and it was his opinion that they wouldn't be able to cope if they needed to take a few backward steps. Chris Foster was confirmed to be suicidal by his general practitioner, Dr. William Gretsch. The doctor testified that he had knowledge of Chris's suicidal ideation four months before the tragic fire. As reported by The Independent, the doctor insisted Chris had given no indication that he was thinking of harming his family during the three appointments they had in March of 2008. The doctor indicated that he had been kept in the dark like everybody else. Patrick Kelly, a financial investigator, told the court how Chris desperately tried to hide his financial ruin from his wife and daughter. 
The Independent reported that at the time of his death, Chris had 20 different bank accounts, one of which was overdrawn by 330,000 pounds, and he'd taken out three mortgages on the mansion. As reported by the Daily Telegraph, Chris had 3.1 million pounds in assets at the time of his death, but debts estimated at 4.4 million pounds. Chris had been living on credit since at least October of 2007, when Ulva Limited had gone into liquidation and a three million pound freezing order on his assets left him without any sort of income. One looming question remained unanswered. Was Chris motivated to commit the familicide solely due to going broke? Or was losing control over the people in his life what set him over the edge? It wasn't the goal of the inquest to decide. On April 3rd of 2009, Coroner John Ellery returned a verdict of unlawful killing of Jill and Kiersey Foster, ruling that Chris had quickly and methodically killed his family before dying by suicide. The coroner spoke of Chris's victims and was quoted by the Daily Telegraph when he said, they both had everything to live for and Kiersey had her teenage and adult life ahead of her. There was no bringing Jill and Kiersey back, but now their loved ones would have the space to grieve. As Jill's family struggled to move past the unimaginable loss, the community had no choice but to move on. After the police investigation and coroner's inquest were officially closed, liquidators, creditors, and High Street Bank reportedly fought over Osbiston House. There were also visitors. Neighbors reached out to police to report trespassers climbing the gates to enter the ruins of what was previously a beautiful mansion. It wasn't just urban explorers stopping by, though. For a while, Kirstie's friends visited every year to place memorial bouquets. The house sat unoccupied for years, listed for sale under the new name Waterside House. In 2009, a Channel 4 documentary special called The Millionaire and the Murder Mansion was filmed on site without permission from the Foster's relatives. Police had sanctioned the filming, which Enid and Andrew Foster found disrespectful. In 2011, BBC News reported that the house was demolished. The property sat unoccupied until 2014, when the land was sold to Kevin Gorski at a discounted rate of £400,000. He used the land to build his dream home, but was faced with an onslaught of structural and safety issues. In a 2020 article by The Sun, Gorski said, It's like there is a curse on the land. Nothing has gone right. Two of the stones have already fallen down. They would have killed anyone walking underneath straight away. I've also electrocuted myself from the wiring. It's like this place has a pass that it doesn't want to let me escape from. Cursed or not, Chris's brother Andrew is certainly haunted by what his brother did and wonders why no one tried to stop him. In November of 2011, he filed a 120-page formal complaint against West Mercia police, alleging misconduct. Among other accusations, Andrew claimed police knew about his brother's gun ownership and that he had threatened former business associates. Andrew commented about the filing to the Daily Telegraph, saying, I'm not seeking disciplinary action. If mistakes have been made, I just want police to admit them so that we can learn from this and put preventative measures in place to prevent gun crimes happening in the future. Nothing ever came of the formal complaint, but Andrew offered public support for a 2014 internet campaign that advocated for better cooperation between police and mental health professionals. Andrew told the Shropshire Star, there are still many questions relating to gun laws that I consider could have prevented the tragic events at Osbiston House and perhaps could have saved the lives of my brother and his family. Some groundbreaking progress has been made in that regard due to more recent incidents. According to the Washington Post, as of November of 2021, gun license applicants in the UK are required to submit a form signed by a physician revealing any health concerns about the individual owning firearms. Familicide is a rare occurrence, but it's happened enough times that studies have been conducted on the topic. In a study conducted by Jacqueline C. Campbell of John Hopkins University, 
A strong link between previous intimate partner violence and familicide was found. According to a 2010 publication by Bernie Ochter in the National Institute of Justice, Campbell's study found that intimate partner violence had previously occurred in 70% of familicide cases studied. Campbell also found that most people who commit familicide are white men and having access to a gun is a big risk factor for this crime. All of these risk factors, coupled with Chris's significant financial troubles, were a recipe for disaster. The death of the Foster family continues to be analyzed and reflected upon. In December of 2021, Dr. Elizabeth Yardley, professor of criminology at the School of Social Sciences at Birmingham City University, published an ebook on the case. According to the book summary, Murder in Maysbrook examines Dr. Yardley's theory that the killings represented continuity rather than change. He, Chris Foster, was a bully, an abuser, and a misogynist. It's likely that nobody will ever know the true reason why Chris chose to demolish the life he built. Those close to the Fosters can choose to focus on the memories they shared with Jill and Kirsty, trying their best to forgive the man who betrayed them in the worst way possible. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this episode of Murderish. Remember to subscribe to or follow my new podcast, Dirty Money Moves, Women in White Collar Crime, in your favorite podcast app. If you've binged every episode of Murderish and don't want to wait for the next one to drop, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. As soon as you sign up to become a Murderish Patreon supporter, you'll get immediate access to a bunch of ad-free episodes that cover cases not available in the free version of the podcast. To become a Patreon supporter, visit Murderish.com and click the link to go behind the scenes, or just go to Patreon.com and search for Murderish there. I want to say a huge thank you to Vonda H. for becoming a Patreon supporter. Thank you, Vonda. I appreciate your support. If you enjoy Murderish, there are so many ways you can support the show. Tell your friends about the podcast or leave the show a positive rating and review in any podcast app. This helps other people find the show easier. You can also just wear a Murderish t-shirt while you're out and about. Check out Murderish.com for a link to buy t-shirts, bags, coffee mugs, and more. Also, follow Murderish on Instagram and TikTok at Murderish Podcast. You can also find the show on Twitter and Facebook. Murderish sound design and audio editing is by Justin Hellstrom. Some of the music was composed by Nico of We Talk of Dreams. This episode was researched and written by Allison Schwartz. For a list of sources for this episode, visit Murderish.com. As always, Ishers, thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. And remember, listening to this podcast does not make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. Murderish.